Hello and welcome to another episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. I'm your host, Scott Haskin, and I am thrilled to bring you my next guest. He is a podcaster himself, and it was fun to turn the tables on him and make him go from interviewer to interviewee. And he's just as wonderful on the other side of the fence as he is as a podcaster. And uh, But before I go any further, I have to be humble for a moment. I have to apologize to Hammond because we had talked before the show. And I, as I asked all my guests, is there anything special that you want to plug? And he did tell me something. And then I got all caught up in, in the enjoyment of our conversation and forgot all about it. So I told him I would do it in the intro of the show. Uh, which I am doing right now. He hosts a show called America's Next Top Podcaster. And it's sort of an American Idol, uh, but podcast version. I have not had a chance to check out the show myself, but uh, from what he was telling me about it, it sounds like it's a lot of fun and a really great opportunity. And you can check that out at American America's Next Top Podcaster.com. That link is in the show notes. If you look below your screen or if you were already past it, you can scroll back up whatever you'd like to do. But I did want to make sure that I mentioned that because that is a very important thing going on in his life. On top of that, he has his regular show, Beyond the Playlist, which is a fantastic show and features artists, some of which you might know, and a lot of which you may not know. And I really like that because it's really hard for an unknown artist to get exposure. That's one of the biggest challenges that people work with. And uh, and he finds these bands and, and these artists that uh, you know, they they may be signed to a label, they may not be signed to a label, but they don't have a lot of press. And so he gets their their message out there. He gets the the opportunity for them to talk about their work, what projects they've been in, who they've played with, uh, you know, some intricate details of some of their songs, some of their stage experiences, all kinds of things. And uh, and it's a lot of fun. In fact, uh, when he interviewed me a few months ago uh, for Beyond the Playlist. He had found me through Victoria Page, who is a great friend and supporter of the Haskin Cast podcast, and uh, he had interviewed her some time ago, and uh, and then he found me through her because I've interviewed her a couple of times, and you know we're we connect on social media quite a bit, so uh, so he found me there and then invited me to come on his show, which I was very grateful for, and he's such a great interviewer. First of all, he's got a great voice for uh, for broadcasting, so that's the first step. I don't think I have a great voice for that. Uh, in fact, somebody had suggested that I add a little bit of uh, bass to my voice. So I've done that. I think that sounds a little thicker. Uh, but uh, but yeah, my voice in general is not great because I don't speak a whole lot. Uh, I don't really flex those muscles very much. In fact, when I talk on the show, that's probably the most talking that I do during the week. So uh, so I don't have a lot of strength in my voice, whereas I used to. I used to be a halfway decent singer. Uh, now I can't barely hold a note. And uh, that really seemed to change when I had moved to California, where I was so uh, I, I specifically isolated myself a lot to work on projects. And then I would have my networking events and my red carpets and things. And I would go do those and I would start to get really lightheaded. In fact, uh, I remember I met a friend for lunch in Pasadena and he's a software developer. We met at the NAMM show. And uh, so we're having lunch and, and about halfway through, I'm starting to get really lightheaded. And I thought I'm eating. I'm drinking a lot of water. Um, I shouldn't be, you know, feeling like I'm about to pass out. And, and the whole drive home, which was about 45 minutes for me uh, back to West Covina, it, I really kind of felt bad. And then the rest of the day, I, 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 you know, I didn't really know what was going on. And slowly throughout the day, I start to, started to feel better. Well, over the course of a few months and talking to a couple of friends, I came to the realization that the problem that I had was that I was not using my vocal cords, which are muscles, just like anything else. And if you don't work out a muscle, it tends to get very weak. And if you overwork out a muscle, it tends to get very stressed. So what was happening was I would go to these meetings, I would stress out my vocal cords because I would all of a sudden be, be using those muscles a lot. And then uh, I would get lightheaded as a result. So let that be a lesson to all of us who work in our little caves, who, who have our studios, who have our, uh, you know, editing bays and, and whatever. If you're isolated, do things to keep your voice active uh, instead of texting voice text. In, uh, sometimes maybe just pick up the phone and call somebody once in a while and have a conversation. Uh, talk to yourself, walk around the room and do it. The trick to that. And the reason I don't do that is because I'm afraid that I won't shut that off when I go outside. So I might be on my strip walk and just be muttering incoherently to myself. And not that anyone would notice when you're on the Vegas strip. Uh, so anyway, that's my tip for the day or the week or 
until I give another tip, I suppose, uh, use your vocal cords. Very important uh, to flex that muscle or those muscles as much as possible, especially uh, if you want to stay in top form. And uh, now that I know that, I tend to, uh, it very rarely happens to me. Uh, so anyway, that's that's that. And then uh, let's talk about Hammond. So uh, I really enjoyed my interview with him. Thank you so much, Hammond, for taking time out of your busy podcasting and uh, show schedule to come on my show. I have to say I'm very impressed in all these years. He has not missed a show, whereas uh, less than a year in, I'm like, you know what? I'm taking a month off. I need to finish my album. <laughs> and, uh, that only ended up to be a couple of weeks. Uh, well, I, I didn't realize how much of the album I had already written. And so I just had to do some additions, some polishing, uh, changing things in and out, and then mix and master it. Because uh, the vocal, all the dialogue was already recorded. The basic tracks were already written. Uh, so it was just uh, really finishing it up. And I had gotten further than I initially thought I had. So uh, so anyway, the podcast is back in full swing. And of course, I'll be back next week with another guest. And the week after that, and the week after that, I uh, got some fun things planned for Halloween. Well, really for the whole month of October, because if you're a big fan of Halloween like I am or just the season, um, you want to you want to relish it and make it last as long as possible. So uh, the uh, the majority of the month of October will be attached to different things. Halloween, whether it be uh, special effects, makeup or uh, horror movies or things like that, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And hopefully um, I will be able to get back up to Sedona to do the UFO tour before the end of the month and can bring that to you. I got sidetracked, uh, but uh, that's okay. Things happen as they're meant to. And I would imagine had I gone that night, it might not have been as good as the night I'll actually go. And I'm just going to foster that belief. So that's what's happening here. Without any further ado, let's bring on Hammond. Well, well, well. How the turntables... All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to turn the tables and interview the interviewer for a change. I would like you to welcome my very popular host guest, Hammond Chamberlain. Hammond, how are you today? Good. I'm really excited to be here. This is awesome. Thank you. I am too. You know, you interviewed me a few months ago, and even while we were talking, I'm like, I want to interview you. <laughs> and we finally found the time to make it happen. So thank you for taking time out of your crazy, hectic schedule to spend some time with us today. No, I'm really excited about this. I'm glad we were able to make this work. Me too. Uh, now, and hopefully no uh, no connection problems this time. Uh, as I recall, the last time uh, you guys were having a hell of a storm out there and we keep lo uh, kept losing connection. But so far, so good. Yeah, no, it was. And, and through the power of editing, I made it... I think I made it come off, come off pretty good. It really did. Yeah. No, I thought it was magic. Absolute magic. <laughs> so I got to say, how many shows have you done now? Because it seems like when I scroll through the list of available episodes, uh, it's, it's like a, a highway across the country. <laughs> so Beyond the Playlist has been an ongoing podcast now since December 8th of 2013. And I have never missed a week. Oh, wow. And then there are some weeks where I get nuts and release two a week. That's crazy at, at that pace. I think I'm well over 400 now. I don't even know. Wow. Well, you know, there's so much that goes into it that that's just beyond uh, the actual conversation. And then the editing, there's all the scheduling and finding guests and getting any clearances that you need for music rights. And there's so many hours that go into that. That's a pretty amazing statistic to have not missed a week. Congratulations. Yeah, it's one of the things now. It was funny. When I first started podcasting, someone told me three things. Be consistent. Don't be afraid to suck. And when someone asks you to do a thing, you do a thing. Yeah. And I've taken be consistent. I think I might have taken a little too far. <laughs> well, but you've made it work. And, and me just coming off of a, a short hiatus, I was going to take a month off to finish the new Haunted Holidays album, but I ended up finishing it in a couple weeks. And then it just, the timing came up where I was going to do a couple of recordings. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and release them. They're timed with the release of my guest projects. So I guess my break is over. But you've just not missed it at all. <laughs> no. Nope. And, and it was funny. I was actually planning on taking a hiatus this summer. Mm -hmm. But I had this really weird, sudden uptick in listenership. And I didn't want to lose the momentum. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a dangerous game to play. And it's not like it's not like I don't have a lot of things out there for people to listen to, but at the same time, 
I was able to score some pretty interesting guests over the last few weeks to help kind of feed that momentum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a big difference, too. And I think that's part of what really drives at least uh, the way that I work is when people are available to come on. I've got a whole list of people I want to talk to, but so many of them are performing and it's hard to catch them at a time where I can talk to them and they can talk to me. And there isn't a lot of background noise because they're at an event. Uh, or, you know, they're, they've just gotten off of doing a show. So now they're tired. Uh, there's so much that goes into that. Do you find scheduling to be a challenge for you? It, it can be, but I usually have got. So I am so afraid people are going to start saying no, that I'm recording and scheduling interviews, you know, six, eight weeks in advance. I've got before I had my surgery at the end of August, I had nine episodes ready to go. Wow. That way I didn't have to worry about doing anything until I knew I felt better. Right. Yeah. See, I'm afraid that, that they're going to get outdated if I hold them that long. And one of the things I do with that is I work really hard to make my show feel evergreen. So I don't really talk about things that are date specific or project specific. It's all very much about them as a creator, them as a person, them as a them as them as them. And not so much about the current hot thing they're doing, because if I spend too much time on the current hot thing, then it does kind of fade away. But if I keep it evergreen, those interviews I did back in 2013, you know, 2014, they're still, you know, 90 percent relevant. Sure. Yeah. You know what? I hadn't realized that. But now that you say that, thinking back over the many shows of yours I've listened to. Yeah, that's true. You really don't. Yeah, I, think, I think it has to do with the fact of my my history is more about the the internal workings and the reason people do what they do. Yeah. And so I rather talk to them about who they are and why they do what they do and why they choose to tell the stories they tell, you know, write the songs they write, uh, you know, create the images they create. Find out why that happens instead of just saying, dude, that song's awesome. Tell me about how it came about, which I know happened. They sure. went to a studio. They wrote it, they recorded it, and it was released. Right, yeah. Well, and I think it, it can kind of work both ways because you've got the the longevity for the episode and I've got the, like, uh, okay, so I just had Gabrielle Stone on my show with her new book, uh, Eat, Pray, Hashtag FML. And when people discover that book and they, they, they find the podcast, they can have that expanded version of the book where we delve a little bit more into the, the you know, the psyche of it or whatever. And you've got the, I'm a fan of this artist, and I want to know more about them and how they view things. So I think I think they both have their advantages, but I like your concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what I what I really started this show as it was it was really just a, a an excuse for me to talk to people who who I admire mm -hmm. and whose work I admire. And so I started with people I knew who I'd worked with that I really admired what they did. Sure. And then it's moved into the next level of people where I don't know them exactly, but I can get to them and say, I really like what you're doing. I want to share more. Mm -hmm. And I kind of come to this phrase that this, this phrase that I like to use that everyone I interview should be a household name. Right. They just aren't. Yet. Mm -hmm. But this is how they, they get that opportunity to be more known is to have, uh, you know, somebody mm -hmm. who cares enough about them or is interested enough in, in who they are to give them an opportunity to talk and share that with the world. Mm -hmm. You know, then when somebody discovers their band and they Google them, they see, oh, they did a podcast. Let me go check that out and learn about them more. Yeah, no, it, it's been it's been a lot of fun going through and, and just trying to touch base with people who I've listened to for, you know, years and years. There's a guitar player, uh, Joey Tofola, that I interviewed uh, earlier this year. I've listened to his stuff since I was in college mm -hmm. and to be able to sit down and have a conversation with him and say, I've been listening to your stuff since college. This is awesome. It was it was kind of cathartic and, and it let him know that someone's paid attention for as long as that, because I've been out of college for a really, really long time. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and and what a bigger compliment can you pay to an artist that they've been such a huge part of not just I like this song or this album or this film, th just that they've they've had a place in your life for so long. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's a great premise to start because, you know, why why would you want to invest so much time if you're not going to enjoy talking to the people and learning from them? And I, I have to tell you, though, in all honesty, I've listened to a bunch of your shows, nowhere near all of them. But every single episode that I've listened to, I don't even almost care who the guest is. I just enjoy 
listening to you interview them, the questions that you ask, the relaxed comfortability of it all. And I think that your guests really feel relaxed and comfortable with you. And I, I don't know how you created that, but it's like this is definitely something that you were born to do. Well, it, it's really interesting. I start every single show with the same question. Mm-hmm. And that gives me that gives me a gauge on where people are. If I So I ask the question, tell me about yourself and how you got into whatever it is they do. Mm-hmm. That gives me the opportunity to kind of gauge where they're at. If I get, well, I took a bunch of music lessons and now I play in a band. I'm like, oh, crap. I'm going to have to work on this one. Right. If I, get, if I get, well, I was born, I'm a family of, you know, seven, and then I, you know, broke my mom's, you know, spoons playing this, and I get this whole thing. I'm like, okay, awesome. There was a guy I interviewed recently. I asked, tell me about yourself and how you got into music. I didn't say another word for 28 minutes. <laughs> wow. Yeah, there's uh, there's not much work you need to do on a show like that. So, uh, and then there are also people where you can hear them make the turn. There was one lady I talked to and she was very guarded because I it was a cold call for me and we had no history. And um, she brought up where she was from. And I brought up a, a story of when I lived in that same area. And it was, it was all of a sudden, as soon as I told that story, she was like, oh, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. And the rest of the interview was just a breeze. Yeah, sometimes just making that connection or just getting past that initial few minutes of, I don't know what to expect. I don't really know this guy. I don't know what he's going to ask me. Once once you've broken that barrier, a lot of times they can really open up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really interesting. And, you know, I, I interviewed in a inside of a correctional setting. I interviewed people all the time, mm-hmm. uh, evaluating them for mental health stuff or for court reasons or, or any number of things. So there are a lot of tricks and things that I learned working in that setting that I use for this. And sometimes it's it feels like I'm being super pushy or super invasive. But when people are willing to open up and talk to me, because the reason they're here is to talk about themselves. Right. Uh, once I get that going, sometimes it's sometimes it's just a breeze and interviewing is Interviewing style is all about finding out what works best for you. And for me, focusing on the person, not on their work so much, but on them and why they do and how they do what they do, that matters so much more to me because they get asked all the other superficial stuff all the time. Sure. Yeah. And that's one thing I try to do, too, is I try to really get away from the standard questions or uh, in some cases, if I have the opportunity and my guests have done other shows or interviews, I'll listen to as many of those as I can and go, okay, mm-hmm. here's the same questions you get asked every time. So scratching those right off the list, because yep. the listeners that follow a guest are going to have heard other shows that they've been on. So mm-hmm. it's not interesting for them to listen to my show and go, yeah, heard that. Yep. Heard that. Yep. Same answer. Okay. Do you have anything interesting to say? Yeah. Well, one of the biggest, one of the greatest moments for, I think for any interviewer and I count it as a, a, a moment of pride is when I get, I've never been asked that before. Yeah. Yeah. Or what a fascinating question. I've won. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and it's a huge compliment every time, because especially if you've got somebody who's interviewed often and you mm-hmm. get that response, that's pretty big because you've broken a barrier that no one else has. Yeah, I interviewed two guys that have been performing together for over 20 years, and I was able to ask a question that neither of them had been asked before. Wow. And I was like, holy crap. I'm a winner. <laughs> but I think there's another component to you, too. I mean, obviously, you've got a great voice. You're very, uh, you're very easy to listen to. You're not harsh. You're not bassy. You're not tinny. You've just got this perfect voice for having a conversation. But beyond that, you really care about your guests. You know, when they come on, you're not just somebody who has to interview so-and-so. You're genuinely interested. You have a, a history, you know something about them, and it really comes off as, as a genuine conversation more between two friends that are like, hey, you've never told me your story before. Let's talk about it, as opposed to an interview. I I work really hard to treat everybody regardless of status. Like I interviewed Jordan Rudis from Dream Theater. Mm-hmm. And then the very next day, I interviewed an author who published a book of poems on her own and was just a self-published author, but I happened to like her stuff. I gave them the same treatment. And 
it's easy for me to treat everyone nicely and it's easy for me to be invested because I care about the work they do. Right. And what comes across as me giving due respect to new artists is also the same thing that gives the that comfortable kind of welcome to the club kind of a thing I do with established artists. So it all comes across as, I hope, genuine because I'm being genuine. And it's not a matter of one's more important because they're both doing creative things and I'm celebrating them and their creativity, not their status. Right. And status is such a crazy thing to me. I mean, yeah, there, there's a couple people I would say I'm a, I've been a little bit starstruck by. In general, I, I don't. You know, to me, people are people. It's just that some of them have cooler jobs. Some of them have found better opportunities and had the skills to take advantage of them. But, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, anybody who takes an hour or so out of their day to come and talk to me and it, when they could be doing literally anything else, I, I take that to heart. And I hope I mm -hmm. treat everybody equally the same as well. Most of the people, though, that I've interviewed, at least up to this point, I know fairly well. So it's a little yeah. easier because I've got that, you know, I've already got a rapport with them. Uh, but with a couple of them, uh, it's been, you know, I, I met them only for the the purpose of having them on the show to promote whatever they were doing. And uh, but even those seem to have uh, very quickly find that level of comfortability. And I think mm -hmm. you're that's just something you're naturally good at. Well, thanks. I, I appreciate that. I never really I haven't really thought about that aspect. I just kind of approach everybody um, kind of the same way. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned you know, from another job that everybody is just a person and you really don't need to fear anybody. In fact, sometimes the scariest thing is when someone says yes to your your proposition. Right. Because it because then you have to work. <laughs> yeah. That's I'm laughing, but that that really is true. So it's one of those things where when you get someone who's, you know, a more known and has more notoriety or you consider as a big get, um, to be really honest with you, there's a whole section of the population who doesn't even care if they're a big get. Right. So you have to come at them and come at what you do the same with everybody because you never know who's going to gauge who as a big get. Sure. Or who might become one down the road. I mean, you might yeah. be interviewing people that are new to the business now, but down the road, they might be the next Ingve Malmsteen. Yeah, there are there are there are I think three or four people that I can honestly say I was their first interview, mm -hmm. and then one of them went on to be on Face Off and wow. damn near won the thing. No kidding. Yeah. Well, see, and there's a responsibility I think that comes with that too, because if you if somebody's got their first interview and they're they're nervous but they're excited because somebody's finally giving them a chance to talk and that makes them feel like they're getting somewhere as an artist, and they have a bad experience that's really going to going to kind of drive their actions and and things down the road when you know as they grow and they do get more interviews they're going to be a lot more hesitant they'll be standoffish mm -hmm. for a while but if you give them a really good experience the first time out then the next interview they're going to be even more excited yeah and there are people i interviewed you know years ago that i'm still friends with and i work with and do projects with and and it's it's been an interesting experience to develop relationships from some of these flat out cold calls mm -hmm. and you know two three years later i'm working with them i'm doing projects with them i'm part of you know something they're doing that's bigger than everything that i ever thought i'd do right but don't you think a lot of that just stems from the fact that you are genuine that you're not you're not doing this for an angle you're not uh you know hitting them with uh you know, blindsided questions and things like that. You're, you're genuine. People can hear it in your voice. They can feel it. I think that relationships are built on that. So it wouldn't surprise me so much that, you know, after those interviews, then you guys go on to do other things later. I, I would think so. Uh, it's again, it's not something calculating. It's just something yeah. I'm doing. And, you know, there are, I interviewed one lady who does uh, PR and I interviewed another lady who runs a film festival and they live really close to each other, but don't know each other. Oh, wow. So the two of them together and all of a sudden they're, they're, uh, they're totally doing things together. And if it hadn't been for the fact that I knew both of them and respected both of them to say, you two need to work together, then that would have happened. Oh, absolutely. No, that's, a, and that's great that you saw that and you actually took the action because I think in these, these, this day and age, I think a lot of people just don't take action. Yeah. You know, so much I think we miss because people go, oh, you know, wouldn't it be great if nah, it's all the way over there <laughs> and they just, you know, <laughs> let it fizzle out. But now that I mean, you've you've done so many episodes and obviously, you know, 
from where you started out to where you are now, you're much more well known and, and trusted. Do you find it's easier to get more people on the show than it was in the beginning? You know, having time in uh, does matter because when I send an email off to somebody who doesn't have any idea who I am, or even who they're, you know, if I send an email off to their gatekeeper mm -hmm. and they don't have any idea who I am, I can confidently link them to my website and they can start following links and realize, oh, he's interviewed a lot of people and he treats them all really well. Right. That does matter. That does that does get you some credibility. Sure. Sure. Well, it's it's hard to build trust with people who get slammed with a bombardment of we want to use you for something. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's even just to get them to read your email is a challenge. But yeah. to actually get them to say, OK, I'm going to give this guy a chance and then you've got the goods to back it up. That really opens the door at that point. Yeah. And it, it's it's been an interesting process learning how to work with gatekeepers because gatekeepers, you know, they're paid to only put their people on the best or on the the places that will do the most good for their for their person. Right. And as I've gotten more time in, as as I've moved up the ladder of being able to get, you know, a little bit more notoriable, notable people and a little bit more notoriety for even myself that matters to gatekeepers and like, okay, this person might not have the biggest show on the planet. He might not be Joe Rogan or Chris Hardwick, mm -hmm. but his style is different. And if we can keep this on our website, it's a different kind of interview and a different look for our person that matters. Sure. And a lot of times I think people don't, they think about the notoriety of the show, but they don't realize that a lot of times it's just the guest that gets looked up. You know, I go on, uh, you know, my podcast app and, and I might say, you know what? I really wonder what, I don't know, Judy Dench is doing. And so I just, I look for Judy Dench. I don't look for the shows and see what, what she might've been on. I search for her. So there's, mm -hmm. there's that and they're going to find your show. So if you are approaching it from a different angle than most of the people that interview them, there's still some value in that, but you're right. People tend to go for the, how many listeners do they have before anything else? Yeah. And I've had to, you know, I, my show does not have, in a weird way, is is as wide and far-reaching as my show is. In a weird way, it's kind of a niche show. And I also know that my people might, people haven't got to the point where they're listening to the show for me mm -hmm. yet. That's not the kind of numbers I'm pulling in. But when people do discover the show, they realize, oh, he's interviewed these five people that I'm really interested in. So every now and then I get these cluster bursts of similar types of guests. Oh, he's interviewed a bunch of heavy metal people. Let's listen to that. Or, hey, these are all the people that have worked with Mushroom Head. Let's pull those down. Or these right. guys all play Chapman's. Let's listen to this. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, too, is if, especially if you're doing, uh, you know, a band releases a new album and then they want to go out and promote and then you've got uh, five interviews because you get each person in the mm -hmm. band once you've gotten in. And then if you, you know, find somebody that likes that band, you get the influx. And if you don't, then... Well, there's five weeks of other people you're not getting, yeah. you know, it's such a it's it's a it's a real game almost as far as the scheduling of episodes and how to play that, because you can it, it, not really um, manipulate your listeners, but you can turn them off if you're doing a whole slew of things where they just don't happen to be interested in that particular topic or band. And I try to sp space those out like I, I just recently there was an album released called Pattern Seeking Animals. And it featured John Baghold, who's a songwriter and producer, but also featured Ted Leonard, Jimmy Keegan, and uh, Dave uh, Dave Morse, who play with Spock's Beard. Mm -hmm. So I'd interviewed Jimmy Keegan a couple times, a drummer, but it, I didn't. Inter I hadn't interviewed Ted and Dave, so I was able to spread out John, Ted, and Dave over the course of like a month and a half, while this album was kind of getting ramped up for release, and then after just after its release, and it worked out really well because. You know, again, these are people who do a lot of interviews, but I approached it kind of sideways and it worked out to be kind of different stuff. Right. And I think is the real trick to that, though, starting the interviews before the album is released, because if you release it and you spread those interviews out over six or seven weeks, by the time you get to the, the last person, now the album's already been out for almost two months. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of a is that a challenge to because uh, you want to do them all, but then you want to spread it out. Well, I, it can be. And with this one, it was lucky because it was only like three guys. Oh, OK. But it was one of those things where, you know, I didn't want to just pile on all three of them 
three weeks in a row. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I didn't want it before. I didn't want it to be released before the album kind of lost any steam or lost any attention. Right. Yeah, it's tricky because you also want, you know, you want to be able to give them the link to go buy it or at least check it out. Mm -hmm. So hopefully by the time that you get the first interview done, there's something out there that people can go and connect to. Because it seems like if people can't take immediate action, then they'll forget about it. Yeah, uh, I, I do this thing called the Artist Roundtable every year where I have four artists come in. I give them four prompts. They go away for six months because they're all busy professional artists. Mm -hmm. And then they come back in the middle of the summer. We cold review all the art, laugh at the work, have some fun, talk about their techniques, talk about why they made the choices they made, mm -hmm. kind of get real nitty gritty on the whole creative process. Yeah. And one of the things I do is I make sure that I put links to all the artist pages. I put links to their Twitter accounts so that people can follow them because the reason I'm doing this is not because I just want to have cool art and stuff, which is a great by byproduct. Mm -hmm. But I really want these people who took the time to do art for the show to be noticed for what they do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I took that, uh, I do that as well with, uh, with the links. And then I started on my YouTube channel, uh, I started adding uh, videos or things that they've done into a, like a Haskin cast podcast queue so that they can uh, see some of that work as well. But yeah, I mean, if people are going to take the time to, to spend with us and give us that trust, especially those we don't really know. Yeah. I want to do everything I can to help promote them. And that's the whole point in bringing them on the show. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's interesting. I heard an interview with uh, Ian Pace, the drummer of Deep Purple, and he was saying that people ask him questions all the time about why he did this, how he played that drum fill. And he goes, you know, these, this was one moment in time, 20 years ago in my mm -hmm. life. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, that's, that's the thing about some of these interviews is that I, I would love to understand, like, sometimes I get real nerdy about some of the music interviews I do because I like music. I played music. I've been in bands. I've done that kind of stuff. And even with theater, sometimes I get real nerdy about that. Mm -hmm. but I also know that like seven people in the audience will care and the right. rest of them are yeah. now. Yeah. But for those seven people, they're going to really buy in. Sure. And so you have to walk that line between being, Hey, we're going to talk about time signatures and gear for a minute, but we're also going to lean back into the whole, just, Hey, so what's the writing process like? Because having nine people in your band, how does everyone get a voice? And and really varying those questions allows you the opportunity to slip in a couple of those nerdy moments. I get tempted all the time. And uh, I'm so curious about things. And I want to learn from people what I can, you know, what their uh, approaches are so that maybe there's something they do that I'm not doing or or I have forgotten about. And I can adapt in my process as well as my listeners can. Because I have to assume mm -hmm. that a lot of my listeners are creatives as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Now, when you were playing in bands, though, were you playing Chapman Stick or that came after? Yeah, that came way after. I was playing harmonica. I paid for part of college by playing harmonica in bands and in the studio when I was in school. You know, it's it's a sadly lost instrument. You don't hear that very often anymore. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my favorite, you know, I so when I was in college, I was, you know, trying to be Huey Lewis in the news. Mm-hmm. And then uh, in 91, I was hit in the face with John Popper. And I tried to be John Popper, and it took me a long time before I stopped passing out. But I got it down. Tell me you weren't you weren't smoking back then, were you? No, no, no. I, I've okay. never been a smoker. Good. Um, but playing in a bar with smoke, yeah. there was a period of time where I actually suffered from some breathing issues, and they're like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I play the harmonica in a, in a bar band. I'm like, oh, so you're folks smoking like six packs a day. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and of course, you know, it's it's been well documented that secondhand smoke is much worse for you than smoking. Yeah. So um, but then I discovered a guy named Little John Chrisley who played on a Shrapnel Records label. And the dude is the best combination of the speed and like riffage of John Popper and the blues kind of soliness of any of the blues, classic blues artists. Mm -hmm. And there are things he did, like exchanging licks with George Lynch. And I still to this day am awe and floored by. You know, I think that harmonica is always considered kind of a, well, the singer also plays harmonica type instrument, but there is some really serious emotion that can be brought out if you know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, one of my favorite interviews I did was with uh, Howard Levy, who played with uh, um, Bella Fleck in the Fleck Tones. Oh, yeah. And he that was a fantastic. It was so much fun because he just had a harmonica in his hand. And as we were talking, he started noodling around. <laughs> and there are things that I caught on that interview that I, I they're golden and they can't be recreated. That was just a conversation we were having. And he started playing. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's another thing, honestly, to, to go back to your podcast for a minute. I, I think that's another thing that I really like about your show. And this is something I try to do as well, is that it's a very organic conversation. I mean, I might write down a couple of things that, yeah, we need to talk about this and we need to talk about that. But for the most part, I just kind of let the conversation go where it goes. Mm -hmm. and, and I think yeah. that that's how you pick up a lot of those spontaneous things that you wouldn't have if you're the kind of guy. And, and I'm sure you listen to other podcasts and they're like, OK, I have to ask you this question. Great. You answered it. Now, the next question is this. Great. You answered it. And they almost it's like they're not even listening. There are times where I will actually acknowledge it and say, OK, we're about 35 minutes into the show and I would be highly remiss and people would be really upset if I didn't ask you about this. Right. And I, I fully cave to it. They laugh about it. We go on about our business. Um, usually it sparks and leans into another area of the, the topic mm -hmm. that they typically don't get to because I'm acknowledging it. I'm not saying, okay, next I'm going to ask you this question you get all the time. Now it's going to be, I've acknowledged the fact that this is something you get asked all the time. Right. I'm ask it. I might ask it a little differently and let's see where it goes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's really effective too. And, and I've heard you do that a couple of times and I thought that's a great technique because it, you know, they've got to be sick of talking about it, but they know they have to. So let's just acknowledge it. Let's get past it and then move on to the other things. But if I can find something a little more interesting or a way to ask it that you're not used to, uh, if you can make somebody, somebody see something that they're used to seeing through a different set of eyes, that's a pretty amazing moment right there. And I usually wait for a long time before I bring it up. It's not something it's not right out of the gate. Yeah. It it's I usually wait till just past midway through the what I feel would be midway of the interview. That way it's I'm just not jumping on them with the stuff they've already already been dealing with over and over and over again. Well, sure. And plus if you know that your audience is waiting for that, you don't want to have them turn the episode off five minutes in because you decided to just get <laughs> past it at the beginning, you know. Yeah, I yeah. It's true. Yeah. But uh, going back to harmonica, of course, the two songs, when I think harmonica, there's three things that come to mind. Uh, obviously, Piano Man is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Lazy by Deep Purple, because there's a nice harmonica solo by Ian mm -hmm. Gillen. But also the movie Under Siege, because Tommy Lee Jones is playing in very badly, but playing a harmonica. <laughs> no, that's really funny. Uh, my, my, one of the first things I, I remember in pop culture was uh, I was in college and I, there was a movie that came out with Ralph, Ma, Ralph Macchio uh, called Crossroads. Yes. And it had Steve Vai in it and a guy playing harmonica. I'm like, this is the movie made for me. It's got the Karate Kid, Steve Vai, and a harmonica player. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the Karate Kid in his heyday, too. Yeah, exactly. Because didn't they shoot that between uh, first and second one, I think? I think so. I don't know the date off the top of my head. I just know that it came out while he was still, you said, Ralph Macchio with some sort of gravitas. Yes. Yeah. Have you checked out Cobra Kai at all? I haven't. Everyone keeps telling me I need to watch it, but I'm just not into paying for YouTube Red. Yeah, I'm not either. I watched the first couple episodes because they were uh, kind of teasers to get you to buy in. And I thought, you know, it's it's interesting. The show kind of has a little bit of merit to it. Uh it's nice to see the characters again and revisit mm -hmm. them. Cause sometimes, you know, they, they try to re you know, bring these things back and it's not the same writers. It's not the same time. They're at a different skill level. It just doesn't play the same. Uh, mm -hmm. But I have to say the the two episodes that I saw, I thought, you know, this, this is something I could probably get into, but I have a feeling it's going to get off its track before too long. Actually, my nephew who's in his early twenties told me that it's really, really good. And he's been trying to get me to watch it since it came out. Wow. Well, that's a pretty big compliment. I was gonna say you're looking at a kid with a built in short attention span. Yeah. Um, and he's saying that he invested the time to watch it. So it must be it must have some sort of merit to it. Well, that's that's kind of what I was about to say, actually, because in this day and age, it's really hard to keep people gripped on anything, let alone something they don't actually have to do. So mm -hmm. that's a pretty big compliment coming from someone these days who's willing to sit there and, and is captivated enough by it to suggest it to somebody else. 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. Even Stranger Things, which was only eight episodes this year, uh, if that show wasn't so intense from beginning to end, I think that they would not have uh, half the viewership that they have just because of that very reason. People are so easily distracted now. I, I don't know. I think that that pushes the nostalgia button for a bunch of people in my age group. Yeah, mine too. And because of that nostalgia button being constantly pushed and that kind of, oh, I remember that, that happens in each episode. People will keep coming back because of that, because they're trying to kind of recapture that feeling or they want to see what they're going to make a reference to next. Right. And the 80s really was a magical time. I mean, every time is magical, but there was something about the 80s that people of so many generations cling to that music, to the to the nostalgia, to the, you know, the the way of life. And even uh, last weekend, we had Lost 80s Live here in Vegas, where a bunch of bands from the 80s were there. I saw Missing Persons, you know, and uh, it's it's there was, the, it was sold out. So they were found. They were found. Yeah. Well, they they went missing again. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but I mean, it's it, it was sold out, you know, and it was mostly people probably around my age. But there were a lot of very young people there as well. And that music seems to have gripped people of all ages, as opposed to, you know, disco was kind of a you had to be there thing. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people like classic rock, but it's it's kind of getting to that point where the younger generations aren't getting it. So it's it, but the eighties music, there's definitely something about it. So it would make sense that then stranger things would follow along with that. Yeah. 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 So what other songs should be coming to my mind when I think harmonica? Well, let's see. Uh, uh, hook by blues traveler or, uh, or what's the other one that was a big hit? Uh, run around was a big hit for them. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see. Uh, cool is a rule, uh, but sometimes bad is bad by Huey Lewis and the News. Yeah, Huey Lewis with that brass section, they were such a unique sounding, powerful band. I mean, even Harder Rock and Roll has a killer rhythm harmonica part in it. That's right. I forgot about that. I mean, it's just a rhythm instrument, but it's really, really good. Mm -hmm. And harmonica can be used as a rhythmic instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it carries things along very well if it's played right, because you could do it in kind of a staccato you can do it mm -hmm. offbeat, and yep. uh, it makes things a, a little more dynamic. Well, heck, Bad Manners you, uh, did a whole album uh, of country-based ska and had a harmonica playing on a ska album. Wow. That's a unique idea. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. A Buster Blood Vessel honking away on a harmonica is something you need to find. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely going to be a treasure. For sure. <laughs> so how did you come across the Chapman stick? Because that is not a very common instrument. So back in 96, I was listening to Dream Theater, um, Liquid Tension Experiment Volume 1, the first one had just come out. Mm -hmm. And Tony Levin played on uh, Liquid Tension. And then John Y. Young was playing stick on a Falling Into Infinity. But I knew about the Chapman stick kind of in passing because of Tony from his days with King Crimson. I mean, oh, elephant, yeah. Elephant talk is a staple and has been a staple for me for years. And so, but in 96, uh, the internet was just coming around and I Googled and they had a website. I guess, I guess it wasn't Google then. I guess it was like Alta Vista. Oh, them, yeah. Yeah. Or Lycoast them. And, um, they had a website. I looked it up. The instruments were super cool, 10, 12, eight strings, and they were really expensive. And I was not in a place in my career or my life where I had, you know, $2,500 to drop on an instrument that I had no idea what to do with. Sure. Yeah. Or if you would even like. Yeah. So fast forward till uh, 2010. Um, I'm in a different place financially. I'm in a different place in my life. I'm in a place where I want to start trying to do something new because I'm starting to feel old and I want to keep my brain active and I want to challenge myself to learn something. So my wife gets me one for Christmas or my birthday one year. And uh, it's not something I play out. It's not something I'm even good at. But the feeling that I get when I pick it up and look down the neck and start tapping on the strings makes me a better problem solver. It makes me feel creative. It makes me feel like I'm approaching something in a way that no one else is because it's an instrument that's less than 50 years old. Mm -hmm. There's no real established methodology to it yet. There are a couple of people with best practices, but right. there's real established how to do yet. 
And whatever you're doing, you're exploring this new musical instrument. And it's really, really cool. I mean, you have people like the Blue Man Group who use a, a bass string as a as a fretting instrument and a bow and bang on it and slide back and cross across the, the strings to create a like a bowed sound on it. You have people playing it through, you know, distortion pedals and you have people playing it as jazz and guys with double MIDI pickups doing techno music with it. You've got it, it's got no rules and it's really fun playing with an instrument that has no established rules. That's uh, that's the thing about doing something that's different. And I tend to think that if we stopped looking at instruments as we know them, we would find other uses and other sounds we could make with them if we kind of went out of that traditional mode. Mm -hmm. I agree. You know, bowing guitars was, uh, you know, thinking about, wasn't it Steve I that played on uh, Still of the Night by Whitesnake, I think, in the studio? I think he didn't mm -hmm. do the tour, but he did the studio, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, yeah. you know, doing the, the Boeing technique in, in the middle of that was phenomenal. Well, and then you've got, you know, a company that came out and created the Ebo. And right? the Ebo Chapman stick is kind of awesome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, I don't know, are you familiar with Simon Fitzpatrick? Uh, I know the name. He's, uh, he's currently playing with uh, Carl Palmer in the ELP Legacy Tour. And he okay. plays uh, bass and Chapman stick. And uh, that was my first real visual introduction to it. Uh, I had forgotten all about the King Crimson connection, but uh, watching him play that, and this guy's amazing. I mean, he played Rosanna by himself on a six string bass and it sounded phenomenal. Oh yeah. If you want to see something really cool, there's a video uh, by Nick Beggs. And speaking of the eighties, he used to play in a band called Kaja Gugu in the eighties. Oh yeah. But now he plays Chapman stick and bass with like Steve Wilson and Steve Hackett. And wow. he does a he does a solo Chapman piece called "The Darkness of Men's Hearts," and it's available on YouTube if you just want to watch it. But it is the most captivating piece of music I have heard in the last five years. Interesting. Well, you don't get to play with Steve Hackett unless you're, you know, a fairly uh, good player. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah, I I saw uh, they were just here recently. It was Carl Palmer's ELP Legacy Experience, and then uh, Asia. John Lodge's Moody Blues and um, oh crap. Uh, yes, was the headliner. Oh, wow. It was a fantastic lineup. Uh, just amazing. And of course, Carl P Palmer's playing with both ELP and Asia. So they just left his drums up there. <laughs> like, we're not going to bother moving these things. And uh, but it was it was such a, an honor to watch these guys who have made music history and, and who so many musicians wouldn't be where they were. Whether they were fans of them or not, they were influenced by these people. And to see them mm -hmm. perform where I never thought I would see Yes, for example, uh, to see them perform, it was it was just it was breathtaking from beginning to end. I, I haven't seen Yes. I'd like to see Yes. I think the, the closest thing to a legendary group I've seen, I've seen Kiss once mm. um, and I've seen Metallica a couple times and I saw ZZ Top when I was in high school. Oh, okay. We have a uh, Kiss Mini Golf here. That's about as close as I've gotten to them. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, in fact, it was weird. Uh, the tour I saw ZZ Top. It had Stevie Ray Vaughan on it, which was great because I got to see him before he died. It had ZZ Top, but in between, Run DMC played. Well, that's random. Yeah, <laughs> I would not have expected that. It was a, it was a summer of I think eighty eight or eighty seven at Aloha Stadium in Hawaii, and it was the strangest bill ever. Yeah. That was shortly, because wasn't it uh, summer of 90, I think, when Stevie died? Yeah, it was shortly after It was shortly after that he did pass away. Yeah. And at the time, I'll be honest, at the time I didn't really, I thought he was a great guitar player and I loved the music, but I didn't realize that was Stevie Ray Vaughan. I, you know, it was, it was, wow, this guy's awesome. Right. But I didn't realize how awesome and who he was until after the fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know I was 15, 16 years old, and I was there to see ZZ Top play Sleeping Bag. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, they're another great band. They're still doing it. I mean, I love that so many of these bands that have been around since the 70s and some of them the late 60s are still at it, and some of them sounding better than ever. Uriah Heep mm -hmm. uh, yeah. put out an album last year, and I think it's one of their best that they've ever done. Uh, Deep Purple's new album, Alice Cooper's new album, both of them chart toppers around the world. And it's just... I, I, it's amazing to see that that kind of honest music because they they're never they've never been bands that have been geared up to make something radio playable or, you know, unless the record company made them do it. 
but mm-hmm. it, they've always just written naturally. Here's what we feel. Here's what we like. Here's what we want to release. It's never been, well, people aren't going to like that. So let's not put it on the album. It's always been very honest music. And that goes back to what I was saying about you on the podcast and how people gravitate towards that and then want to work with you afterwards. And I think that's part of why these bands are so popular for 30, 40 and 50 years, because it's honest. Mm -hmm. I I fully agree. I think there's something to for bands to stay together. uh, There's got to be something there beyond the music. There has to be a relationship Mm -hmm. and that relationship has to be genuine. So therefore, the work has to be genuine. And that relationship they've developed with the people who've been with them since album one, in some cases, that's got to be genuine. So it's it's one of those things, people who are just there for flash and show, it's never going to last because none of it's real. Right. And whatever trend that they've hopped onto is going to be gone before they know it. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it's hard. It's so hard to keep up with that. Just write from your heart and uh, don't edit too much with your head and you know, people will, will, somebody will gravitate towards it. Mm -hmm. Especially nowadays, because your audience will find you. I mean, you put your stuff on Bandcamp, you tag it right, people will find you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think that's really the the key to any business being successful is just being honest and natural. And I think, I think there's just an energetic connection that you'll find with people that are like-minded. Yeah. Yeah. Now, are you, uh, so you were playing in what kind of bands though, when, when you were playing harmonica, were you doing like, uh, you were playing in bars. So was it like, uh, blues and rock? Uh, when I was playing in bars, it was blues and rock. Um, but I was, I was playing everything from straight up hardcore, uh, boot kicking country to, you know, run through a distortion pedal and a phaser kind of to rock. It was whatever they paid me. They gave me some advanced listen, and then I just jumped in. Nice. So you had to write a lot of your parts then? I Writing is a really gra- uh, generous term. Most of it was <laughs> coming with stuff on the spot in the right key. Well, that's writing. <laughs> it's uh, even, even jamming is you're still writing something. So I, I'll give you yeah, that credit. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, but, uh, but now you're, you're doing some recording. So I, I heard in one of the shows that you're working off of logic and that's, uh, has that been your, uh, was that your go-to from the beginning? Uh, I, I only got logic within the last like three or four years as a, frankly, as a gift, someone said, here's a gift card by logic. Wow. Um, uh, it was my mother-in-law. So credit where credit's due, but, um, I was using garage band. I worked in audacity and for, for, even when I was playing live and doing stuff like that, I I dragged around an old uh, Tascam DAP1. Basically, it was a a, a DAT portable DAT recorder that was really really bulletproof. Mm-hmm. And I recorded everything we did live. I recorded every time I got in a studio. I just had them hook it up to the the board and just recorded all the stuff I did. And then when I was recording at home, I had a you know a four track or I had a um, you know, an external, you know, hard drive recorder or something. I was, I've always been recording. That was the thing about getting into podcasting. I knew how to do a good recording. I knew how to not sound like garbage. Right. Yeah. And and your show is crystal clear. Absolutely crystal well, clear. Thank you. I, again, it's one of those things where I knew how to do a good recording, but I, uh, the part I was worried about was all the techie stuff, like getting it launched and mm-hmm. getting a Twitter account. And, you know, I had zero internet footprint when i started the show like i had like eight people as friends on facebook and i knew them all wow that's yeah that's really no footprint i didn't have instagram i didn't have anything when i started in 2013 wow so all of that stuff is what i had to kind of learn and was this insurmountable mountain to climb and you know i'm still it's very much a learning process the whole idea of learning how to use hashtags to get people to pay attention to your show that's a weird thing for me yeah. But it's really something I need to know and use. And it, and it's really an up and down thing. I mean, when I first got on Instagram, if I hashtagged, you know, a couple of things, then all of a sudden within 10 minutes, I'm getting, you know, 100 likes on my picture. And uh, mm-hmm. now it seems like I can follow that same formula and I get 12. Yeah. A lot of it is all about engagement. And that's the thing. I would rather have 10 people who listen to a show who are fully engaged in what I was doing and responding and communicating and talking and giving me feedback mm-hmm. and having 10,000 that didn't respond and interact with me. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, it's nice to have likes and clicks and all of that, but it's it's nice to have people that engage because that really shows that you're you're affecting them in some way that they felt that they wanted to take the time and talk to you directly about something. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I've never been a person that's cared so much about the statistics. Like I, you know, have 5,000 followers on Twitter and that's great, but how many of them actually engage me? How many do I actually talk to? Pretty much none of them. You know, mm -hmm. there's a handful. So what does that really mean to have that number? It looks good, I suppose, on a stats page. If somebody wanted to check me out to, to see if I'm legitimate or not, I suppose that looks good. But uh, for me, if they're not engaging, then it's just a, stat, a statistic. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that's the thing about, you know, Beyond the Playlist has a has a Facebook group and I will post an episode. And then if it's a musical guest or if there's something I can link to, I'll throw a YouTube thing in to kind of be in tandem with the episode. So people kind of get an idea of what they're getting into. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really like that you, uh, you know, when you have new members join that you post that new people joined and you ask everybody to mm -hmm. welcome them. I mean, that's a really good, uh, warm, fuzzy way to join a group. Well, and, it, it, and again, it's kind of who I am. If someone's taking the time to come in, I want everyone to realize that, hey, they're taking time to come talk because of me. So yeah, this is a huge celebration because I'm kind of a dork. <laughs> yeah, well, that may be. But, you know, I, I think that, that uh, that's part of the charm. <laughs> you know, that's how you get people in there. So. With uh, with you being a family man, I mean, you've got kids, you've got a wife, and, and you've got this podcast that you do, and then you have other work you do on top of that. How do you balance all of that? I mean, I know just for myself the the amount of effort and time the podcast takes. How do you find time to do everything? A lot of it is it's it's it, a lot of it is just really really good scheduling and time blocking. Mm -hmm. And you know, if I have an interview that's scheduled and they're fifteen minutes late. I'm I'm moving on. I don't care who they are. I've got to send a message saying, "Hey, I don't know what's going on, but we got to reschedule." Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, it's very much a cut and run. And that's the other thing I really try to do is really value everyone's time. If you tell me, if I tell you the interview is going to be thirty to forty five minutes, you're out at forty minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, if if you're going to have me on your show, there was there was a show that I was on, and they said we're going to hit record at seven thirty. We didn't hit record till 9.15. Wow. And I told him, I said, I'm not coming back until you get this problem fixed. This is not happening. Oh, it was a technical error. Well, no, it was one of the people didn't show up and they just held on to me, hoping that someone else would fill in the spot. Really? They didn't just go ahead and interview you? No, it was a, it was, it was a different kind of panel show. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So it was, it was, it was one of those things where I'm like, I'm not. If you're not going to value my time, I'm not coming back. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's a tough position for them because if somebody on, you know, somebody else didn't show, they can't control that. But turn it into yeah. something then. Let's say, OK, well, let's not do the panel then. Let's just talk to you and learn about you. And, mm -hmm. You know, you've got somebody there. Or cut me loose and say, hey, can we call you, call you back? Yeah. If we get somebody, if not, can we reschedule you? I mean, there are lots of ways to handle that where they're not just sitting on me while I'm waiting for stuff. Right. And that's got to be a long, awkward couple of hours. Just, okay, we're going to give them five more minutes. You know, we were hanging out and chatting. We were hanging out and chatting. But at the same time, I'm like, gee, my family's had dinner now. Yeah. And my kids are asleep. And, you know, it, my wife's probably starting to get drowsy. So we're not going to get a chance to really chat with her. And it was just like, people's time is also valuable. So if you, if you tell someone you're in and out, then you're in and out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I try to be, you know, respectful of people from every angle as, as much as I can as a human being. And, you know, if somebody is, is taking that time and blocking it out to come on my show, absolutely. And, and, you know, sometimes you get to talking and you start the episode a little late because you're having a conversation. And I've gotten mm -hmm. better about curtailing that, but more it's along the lines of here's like, like, you know, here's what the show is. If you haven't had a chance to listen to it, you can do this, you can do that you know, just kind of lining them out so they feel comfortable. But sometimes, especially if it's somebody I'm really familiar with, we might talk for half an hour and then I say, oh, you know, we should probably hit record. Even if it's someone I'm not familiar with, I interviewed um, uh, Stephanie DeBruzzo, who originated the part of Kate Monster in Avenue Q and was the voice of Perry Dawn on Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked for two and a half hours. I used 90 minutes of the conversation. I wasn't planning on that. 
Mm-hmm. But you know, I could check in with her and say, "Are you okay if we keep going? This is this is great." And she's like, "Yeah, no, this is awesome." Yeah. And then um, Russell Brower, who used to work for Blizzard, or I guess he still does some contract work for Blizzard, but he used to, he was the musical director for Blizzard Entertainment for years. Wow. We talked, we talked for almost three hours. I only used an hour of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, boy, I just saw that Blizzard's looking for a sound designer too, and I have to say uh, that's a tempting gig. But uh, I'd have to move back to California, which I I really, you know, I prefer to stay here in Vegas. But uh, it'd be fun to be a part of one of those projects. Mm -hmm. So are you are you hoping to go back into band work at some point or are you just kind of happy where you're at? I think I'm kind of happy where I am. If there's, you know, I've got some friends in town that still do open mic. I have uh, some friends there. They play in a live karaoke band. So. They've got a list of songs. You pick the song, you get up and sing, and they're your band. It's called This Is Your Band. And I've known those guys since I was in college. And every now and then, you know, they'll post and I'll say, hey, do you mind if I pop down? And I, pl- I have every intention to. I still haven't. But it's something that's there and I might do it sometime. That is, I love that concept of having a live karaoke band to back you up. But you got to be you got to be real quick to be familiar with the music that you're playing. I mean, you have to know a lot of songs. They're exceedingly good. They've been playing in bar bands and, you know, pop cover bands for years and years and years and years, probably 30 years. So they're the backlog of music these guys have. It's kind of dumb how much they know. <laughs> yeah, it, it would have to be because those catalogs are huge. It, 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 if you want people to come and sing, you've got to give them a large variety of music to choose. Yeah, from. I mean, these are guys who've covered everything from the Blues Brothers to Soundgarden and, and everything in between. Yeah. But even they have to have those songs where they're just like, oh, God, they picked that again. Please don't do Summer Nights. Yeah, exactly. Or Summer Lovin', which is yes. you know, even worse. Yeah. Or the other extreme, which would be like uh, Paradise by the Dashboard Lights by Meat Loaf or, you know, one of those 10 minute journeys that <laughs> you got to trim it somewhere. That's just not fair to, yeah. to everyone else who wants to sing or who wants to take their ears home with them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it's cool, though. You know, did you find when you started playing Chapman Stick, did you find that you started seeing music through a different set of eyes? I did, because it's the the classic tuning is basically the circle of fifths. And so when you start seeing musical theory physically right in front of you, it changes the way you look at things. Mm-hmm. And it changes the way you write, because the instrument you're sitting at changes what you do because of physical limitations and physical um attributes of the instrument i mean a piano you have to write a certain way because of the way it's laid out guitar you have to write a certain way because of the way it's laid out right every instrument kind of leads to that well the chapman stick leads to that but it's a completely different way it's like uh, nothing you've ever held before exactly and i you know when i started playing bass i started appreciating it from a whole different level because it's so much harder than most bass players make it look but mm-hmm. I also started kind of attacking music from a, a different angle because I had never seen through the eyes of a stringed instrument that way before. Mm-hmm. You know, so I could definitely see that being something that would inspire you. And uh, but it's it's I've never played a Chapman stick, but it looks like a lot of fun. But it also looks difficult. It's it's not that difficult because the notes and the way it's laid out is so logical that mm-hmm. once you understand the note geography, all you have to do is point your finger at a note and it plays. Oh, okay. Okay. Does it take a lot of maintenance to keep it in tune? Uh, see, and, and okay, so the wooden one that I had, I had a, a rosewood one first. And for whatever reason, whether maybe it's Salt Lake, maybe it's me, maybe it's the room I had it in, I spent a lot of time making sure it was straight before I could play it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I sold it and bought a rail board, which is uh, a, a aluminum. And now I pick it up and play. I, it stays in tune for the most part and I pick it up and it plays and it's fun. Well, wood breathes. I mean, it's, that's why you have to like acoustic yeah. guitars need to be humidified in that. Um, yeah. Wood, wood reacts to temperatures and, and weather. And when it's a stick, basically with yeah. tension strings on it, it's going to react in weird ways too. But you know, it's been designed to be dealt with and it's a very ingenious design. And when when you know how to do it, it's great. But for me, I was still learning. And so that was one of those things I was taking 25 minutes of a, maybe a 45 minute area of playing, trying to get it straight. And that was frustrating for me. So I sold it. The guy that's got it now, he's killing it with it. He loves the thing. He's, he, 
He does EDM with it. He uses it as a trigger Ableton Live. Really? Yeah. <laughs> now that is not anything I would have expected. I would have heard today. <laughs> but I, but I, but see, that's what I mean. Like using instruments for things that we hadn't thought of. I love the concept of that. You know, yeah. to, to to be able to utilize it. And of course, anything can can be used as a MIDI trigger nowadays, which is, yeah. is great. Uh, I tried to learn Ableton and I, it just wasn't something I got along with very well. I'm a sonar guy. I've been with sonar since cakewalk, uh, like 4.2 in the oh, early nineties. Wow. And, mm -hmm. uh, even through the whole, uh, Gibson nightmare and them, uh, dropping it and then, uh, uh, band lab picking it up. Thankfully, uh, it's, it's still my go-to DAW. And I've tried, I haven't tried logic because I'm a PC guy and logic isn't available. Mm -hmm. Although I am super jealous of the fact that you guys got, um, oh, I can't think of the name of the synthesizer now. It was made by, um, it was an obscure one that that Logic actually bought the rights to, and only, it's only in Logic. They won't release it to anyone well, else. It, what is it, or, uh, um, It'll come to me later. I'll, I'll, it, yeah. It'll hit me. But uh, but it, but I've heard people just absolutely love Logic or just dreadfully hate it. Yeah. I mean, the only other thing that I could ever see myself moving to is maybe Premiere, not Premiere, um, the Adobe stuff, because mm -hmm. it's so universal. Everyone has it. I could put everything onto a thumb drive and no matter what computer I'm in, I could log into my Adobe creative account and take it. Yeah. I liked, um, I, I liked pro tools. It was okay. It's, you know, it's kind of like a word processor when you go from one to another, it's just learning the idiosyncrasies, but the basics are, are mm -hmm. the same. Uh, I also like digital performer. That was a lot of fun, but at the end of the day, I can get things done 10 times faster in sonar because it's what I've always used. That's the thing with me. And logic is so big and robust. I don't know how sonar is, but I feel like I only use usually about 10% of the whole package. Yeah. Because I've become very, very good at the stuff I need to know how to use. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that I'm not even messing with because it's it's just so big and so robust and got so many features. And you know, I have a MIDI controller and I, you know, I sometimes will mess around with, you know, writing my own stuff and doing things, you know, more musically. But as far as, you know, dealing with voice and, and mixing and editing, uh, you know, it's, I'm using maybe 15 percent of the whole power of the package. Sure. And we tend to only learn what applies to what we need for whatever project. And then mm -hmm. if we need it again, we kind of know how to do it. and We'll probably have to refresh ourselves. But I'm with you. There's so many things that it can do that I just don't need. I don't need to be able to make grooves because I, that's just how I write, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't need a drum replacer because I'm not using live drums right now. And. Uh, it's nice to have those things available if I ever do need them, but there's so much that, but they're really trying to round themselves out to be able to apply to everyone so that whether you're doing yeah. EDM or punk or, or classical, you can use the system. And the greatest thing about band lab now is it's free. Yeah. Oh, wow. Where I've put thousands of dollars into, you know, sonar upgrades and, in, 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 you know, cakewalk add-ons over the years, uh, band lab, when they took it, they said, you know what, we get our money from other sources. We don't need to, this was a passion thing for us. And they've been Johnny on the spot with the updates and, uh, really, really excited about the way that they're passionate about that program. You know, it's funny. I bought Cubasis for the iPad thinking that I would have a, a nice DAW, you know, music system to work with on the iPad. Mm -hmm. and I have to tell you, I have a really hard time navigating. I don't know if it's on the, because of the way it's laid out on the screen or if it's because it's a touch screen or my mind is just, just used to working with things in a different format. I really struggled to get used to Cubasis on the iPad. Really? Yeah, I, I have it. Uh, the reason that I got the uh, light version was because when it was older version of Sonar, when Gibson still owned it and they were really, really weren't doing anything to update it, uh, Waves kind of dropped them as someone that uh, they supported. So mm -hmm. uh, I wanted a Waves program. I can't remember which one it was, but I got it not realizing that. And then I was stuck. And uh, so I ended up getting the light version of, of Cubasis. And it was really just for that one Waves plugin so I could process it. And then I would export it and go back to uh, Sonar. But Cubasis is a, is a beast of a program. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there, there's a lot of intricacies to it. And where I just use the comparison of the word processor, I would say that's more like going from a word processor to a computer slash typewriter. It seems like some of it's could really be upgraded and some of it's just beyond what anything else is. Yeah, exactly. Very imbalanced. Yeah. 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 It's a weird, it's a weird program, especially when you look at it on the iPad interface. 
Yeah, I'll have to see that because I, I would, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, shows here use that and, and they use Ableton. And that's kind of why I wanted to get into Ableton, but I just, I couldn't really sit with either one of them very well. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're a waves guy, right? You, you're the, you oh, like yeah, the I love waves. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm all about the waves. Do you think, it, it, I find this interesting that they, uh, you know, their, their packages used to be like 6,000 to $10,000. And, uh, you know, now they've dropped some of those to a couple hundred over the years and, uh, when they do these sales, like you know, their plugin might be $150 and then they drop it to $29 for a sale. Do you think it kind of devalues it a little bit in, in your mind when you see that, that they're just kind of almost giving it away in comparison? No, I think I'm getting lucky because I'm a guy working out of his basement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they just did this sale. And, and as soon as I saw it, I'm like, I'm not falling for that. It was uh, buy one plugin for $29, get a second plugin for a dollar. And I'm like, yeah, that's a that's a good price. That's a good gimmick, guys. And I'm like, I'm not falling for it. I'm not falling for it. And then I went ahead and bought, you know, you know a couple of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually bought an EQ during that, or an EQ and a um, a DSer. Oh yeah, yeah. Those are well. That's especially great for a podcaster. Yeah, because the DSing, if if someone is a very much of a sh talker, getting rid of that sound going directly into your brain through a pair of ear airpods or earphones it's going to get old i i tend i think it's it's probably just because i've edited so many audiobooks and things over the years that i think my brain tends to just shut that off like i don't <laughs> i don't hear it as much as i used to whereas normally as an audio engineer that would just eat right into your ear mm -hmm. you know um, but that's that's cool i'm glad that that you uh that you have all these different facets because you can enjoy art from the creation point you can enjoy it from just being a performer or jamming uh you can enjoy it as an engineer and you can enjoy it from the different artists that you talk to i mean that's that's really a great thing to be able to see through all these different sets of eyes and appreciate art on so many different levels you know i never really thought of it that way but it's that it, you're you're not wrong it's uh it really is interesting that the fact that i can you know move from backstage to the back of the house, you know, metaphorically speaking, mm -hmm. and enjoy it in every step of the way. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. And and then obviously all the interviews that you do, you get to learn different perspectives, different techniques and things that you probably would have never stumbled across any other way. Yeah, there's a guitar player I talked to. He's a British guitar player who plays prog and metal. And when I asked him how he writes, he doesn't even hold an instrument. He sits with a piece of paper and just writes because he doesn't want to be limited by what he already knows. Mm. So he writes freely, and then he has to go teach himself what he wrote so he's not limited by what he did. He's got to figure out how to play what he wrote because he hears it in his head. And so by writing away from his instrument, he challenges himself to be more creative than just the limitations of what he's comfortable doing. Well, that's a fascinating process. Yeah, I will say that when I write uh, by hand on, on score paper, as opposed to sitting at the keyboard, I definitely do have a different style of writing. And uh, I had knee surgery a few years ago, and I couldn't quite sit at the desk for a couple of days. So I just laid on the couch and I had some score paper with me and I wrote a couple of pieces that I would have never come up with had I been sitting at a keyboard. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah. And, and most rock music, they say, uh, is guitar heavy because it's written on guitar because those are the only instruments that you would be able to utilize to come up with the kind of riffs that that create that music mm -hmm. so yep. that makes sense you know or a bass player could do it you know mm -hmm. wow well hammond i can't thank you enough for uh sitting and chatting with me for a while it's been it's it's always a joy to talk to people who a understand you and, and the effort that you put out you know uh, but you're just a great guy and so knowledgeable and and such a, a friendly, honest guy. And I find that to be such a rare thing these days. It's it's sad I should have to compliment that because that <laughs> really should be the norm. But I appreciate that in you, my friend. Well, I really, really appreciate that. That's super flattering. Um, you know, I, I, I've spent so much time in other career fields that I'm really just kind of enjoying this for what it is, which is an opportunity to talk to people who I admire and who I want to talk to. Some people collect autographs and pictures. Mm -hmm. I interview. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. And, and you, and you get to share that with everybody. I mean, your podcast is available worldwide. 
So, you mm-hmm. know, it's, it's not like a baseball card collection where people have to come over to really appreciate it. Anybody can jump on and listen. So if you're on uh, Apple Podcasts, if you're on Podbean, which is the app that my show is on, so I listen through that because uh, I get some strange credits for hours. I'm, I'm actually almost a professional listener <laughs> as well as a podcaster. So uh, yay for me. Uh, and it's also on uh, iTunes and uh, YouTube. And it's called uh, Beyond the Playlist. And it's a, it's a fantastic show. You're bound to find tons of things that you'll enjoy if you give it a chance, which I highly suggest that you do. Thank you, Hammond, so much for coming on the show. It, it's definitely a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time you gave to chatting with me. Yeah, definitely. And I'm sure that uh, at some point we'll have to do this again. We'll revisit and see how much we've learned. <laughs> <laughs> well, best of luck with your show, my friend, and heal up quickly. Oh, thank you. Yeah, take care. We'll talk to you soon. This is what I'm always thinking and always talking about, at least to myself, is that staying honest, being genuine, following the things that excite you, that make you happy. Those are the things that bring that kind of success that we all want, especially those of us in the entertainment industry. I think it just fosters that energy, you know, the energy supporting others, uh, people that we believe in, and that in turn will boost us up as well. And hopefully that's the case. So thank you for joining me for another episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. Please remember to share with your friends, to rate, to review, make a note, send me a, a question, whatever you like. Uh, iTunes, Podbean, Google Play, Spotify, all the places that you can follow. Also, make sure that you follow the Haskin Cast podcast. Thank you guys for uh, joining me and we'll see you next week for another episode. Cheers. Cheers.